pick up where we left off. If you remember, we were looking at uh, discrete memoryless sources, which, which is essentially a source of information. We think of it as a box that has a set of symbols, which I call xi, where i is going from 1 to m. So it has a set of distinct uh, symbols that is sending on the line. And then these symbols come with a probability mass function of xi, which is a probability of x equal to xi. Right? So here I have maybe x1, x3, x n minus 1, and so on. Right? These, these are the symbols that the discrete memory resource is placing on a, on a transmission line. And I know it's a finite alphabet. It has n different possibilities. And it comes with a probability mass function where probability mass function describes probability of uh, this source generating each one of these symbols. The source is memoryless, which means that, uh, that what is being sent at any given time does not depend on what was sent before. Right, so that's a simplification. We're going to deal with that a little bit later, but for right now, it's the simplest uh, possible assumption. Now, what we also did is we defined an entropy of the source. And we said the entropy of the source, h of x, was defined as sum when i goes from 1 to m, probability of i ld ld of pi with a minus in front of it. This, uh, this also we call this pi, probability of the i symbol appearing on the, on the, uh, on the line. This minus ld of pi, or ld of 1 over pi, we call that self-information in a given symbol. And the entropy of the source is essentially the average self-information of the symbol. Right? And we kind of intuitively understood that the larger the entropy, the, the more information is coming from the source. If the entropy goes down, that means the source is very predictable. It's not sending anything new. Right? Uh, we, at the, at the very end of the, of the, last, uh, uh, of the last lecture, we determine that given that the symbol has that the source has m different symbols, what is the largest entropy it could possibly have? And we went through some math and discovered that the largest entropy uh, of a source that has m symbols is going to be log base two, or just ld of m. So this is the maximum entropy. of a source. The source that has maximum entropy is the source that has equal probabilities among the symbols. Right? That's the one that uh, is the least predictable. Because I'm looking at the source, it has n possible symbols, but they're all equally probable. So my guess is the least educated. If you have a source that has, for example, two symbols, 0 and 1, but sends 1 99% of the time, my guess about what is coming is is uh, is pretty educated, and I can, with a 99% reliability, guess that it will be one, right? So that means that information that is coming from the source towards me is relatively small, on average. Now the source for which there are two symbols, for example, and all of them are equally probable, I have no way of guessing, or I can guess with a 50% reliability. And that one has a maximum entropy, and the maximum entropy is LD of M. Now, uh, I guess converse of an entropy of, uh, of, uh, is something called redundancy. So redundancy of the source redundancy of the source that has uh, M symbols of a discrete memoryless source with n m symbols 
in its alphabet is defined as, as follows. R is going to be age max my, minus the actual age of x divided by age max. So this tells us how far is the actual source relative to the source with the maximum entropy. Okay? If the source has the same uh, if the source has the same probability of all the symbols, then its entropy is maximum and its redundancy is zero. If the source has, uh, let's say, m, m symbols, but it's always sending one of them, in which case the entropy is going to go to zero, it has a maximum redundancy. It's a very redundant source. It's always sending the same. Every other source is going to be in between these two extremes. So let me kind of refresh your, uh, uh, by work for an example, to refresh your memory how we use some of these uh, equations here. I'm going to consider a source that's a discrete memorable source that has uh, five symbols. So m is going to be equal to five. And then let's determine their probabilities. Probability of x1 is going to be 1 half. Probability of x2 is going to be 1 quarter. Probability of x3 is going to be 1 eighth. And probability of x4 is going to be 1 16. And probability of x5 is going to be 1 16 as well. Right? The sum of these probabilities has to be equal to 1. There are no other choices. The, the source can send one of these symbols. There's nothing outside of this alphabet that is allowed. Now, if you look at uh, the, the, let's say, let me just do this. Uh, this is your LD of PI. And let's say this is PI. This way. LD of PI. And this, uh, And this is going to be pi sum times ld of pi. So uh, if this is a pi, ld of this pi is going to be uh, minus, uh, or is going to be log base 2 of 1 half, which is going to be minus 1. So minus ld of pi, is, uh, pi times ld of pi is going to be 1 half. The, LD of PI here becomes minus 2. So this becomes uh, 1. It's going to be PI times LD of PI with a minus. So this becomes 1 half as well. 1 8 becomes minus 3. So this becomes minus 3 uh, times uh, 8 with a minus. So it's going to be 3 8. And then here I'm going to have minus 4 minus 4, so this becomes 4, 1 quarter, 1 quarter. So if you sum all of these, you end up with an entropy, which is 1.875. So that's the entropy of this source. Um, how do you get this? You sum it. So this is 1 plus 1 is 1 half, and 1 half is 1. This is 1.5. And probably this is uh, 375, so this is 1.875. So that's the entropy of this particular source. If we, what is the H max? H max is the maximum entropy with a source that has five independent symbols. When you calculate, this is 2.32 uh, shannons or bits. When you put here, here bits. So your redundancy in this case is going to be uh, H max, so this is 2.32 minus 1.875 divided by 2.32. So redundancy here is 0.1918, which is 19.80%. So this source is about 19% redundant, meaning that uh, the, you know, the, it, is, it is this far from the source which has maximum entropy, the one that has equal probability of all of its symbols. 
So that's a refresher of how we use these formulas. Now, let me uh, uh, state a theorem. This is uh, uh, one of the two theorems that we're going to uh, carry and, uh, in, this, in this section here on information theory. Uh, it's called the uh, uh, source coding theorem. And here's what this uh, theorem says. A source, a dis discrete memoryless source with entropy h of x can be encoded at any rate are larger than h of x without uh, or with arbitrary small small error. Conversely, If r is smaller than h of x, then error probability will bound, then error probability will be bounded away from zero. So there's a lot of things here. Let's just stop for a second and appreciate what this theorem is telling us. Uh, it is uh, linking uh, this entropy quantity to our fundamental goal. Remember, our fundamental goal is the goal of compression. I want to determine the minimum number of bits that I need to use per symbol to encode particular particular uh, you know, source, particular information source. So information source is putting these symbols out and I'm saying, well, what is the, the minimum bits per second or minimum bits per symbol that I need to use to encode this source? What is the smallest number of bits that I can use to encode this particular source? And this theorem tells me this. If the minimum uh, number of bits per symbol that you can use is equal to your entropy, right? If you try to encode the source with a number of bits that is smaller than entropy, you cannot do that. You're always going to uh, have an error, right? And, and you're not going to be able to in, in, encode this without an error. But as soon as your coding rate is above the entropy, you have a chance of encoding the source without any error. So going back to our example here, you know, we look at our discrete memoryless source. It has a five, five symbols. If I'm trying to use, let's say, natural encoder, the one that we know so far, since five is larger than four, I need three bits per symbol, right, to encode this so that I, I know uh, which symbol I'm encoding. Let's say this is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, all the way to uh, what 1, 0, 1 would be the last one. Now, that gives me three bits per symbol on average. But according to this uh, theorem here, you're actually not the, as efficient as you could be. Well, this theorem says you can devise a coding scheme that will have an average number of bits per symbol that is smaller than 2. As a matter of fact, 
And this, and not only that, this is the best you can do. <coughs> if you try to compress this even further, where you try to devise a coding scheme with a less of 1.875 average bits per symbol, you're going to always have an error in your representation. You have, what you recover from that scheme is going to be different than what you have uh, sent on the transmission side. That's a very powerful theorem. It's, it's uh, what is called source coding theorem or, or Shannon. <coughs> the, R, the, R in the theorem. theorem is not redundancy. Hmm? The R in the theorem. No, it's it's ray. That's not redundancy. This is different than this. This is ray. Any ray. R. Ray. 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 Right. This is different than this. This is redundancy. Right. That's a good observation. And it's both symbols. Right? Okay, so, so it's powerful in its in its uh, insight, right? It tells us it tells us what can be done, but it's also problematic. Why is it problematic? What's problematic about this theorem? It doesn't tell us how to do it, right? It just uh, it tells us, and that's the true with the, uh, those two, this theorem and the next one we're going to talk about. And uh, this one is actually pretty, uh, uh, it, it's, it's not as bad, because here, even though it doesn't tell us how to do it, we're going to see pretty soon that uh, we know how to do it. There is uh, something called Hoffman algorithm, and we're going to co cover that and understand how we can actually do this thing. The other theorem, which is the Shannon capacity for, uh, uh, theorem, is of the same nature, it tells you what the capacity of the channel is, and, but doesn't, also doesn't tell you how to do it. And we've been chasing that boundary ever since, right? So it's been, a, it's been a, almost, a, I would say, 80 years that we're after that boundary. We're getting close, but we're still, we're still, uh, uh, still struggling, I guess. So, let me, uh, you know, because a lot of these things, you know, uh, I think become really clear once you start doing examples. So let me do another example of, uh, of, uh, of uh, source. We're going to calculate uh, its redundancy, its entropy, and then, uh, and then after that I'm going to explain to you how you generate a code that will be actually able to get to, to this rate that will actually be able to encode your information with a rate that is arbitrarily close to your entropy. So let's look at uh, this following example. Uh, we have eight symbols. And uh, here are their probabilities. P1 is one half, P2 is one third, and then P3 is 136, P4, 136, P5, 136, P6, 136, P7, 136, and P8 is also 136. So you have a source that have, it has a large <coughs> Uh, large disc, uh, difference in probabilities between individual symbols. You can see the first symbol is very probable, and these symbols P3 to P8 are, are quite improbable relative to the first one. So what do you expect to uh, have as an entropy for this source? Is it going to be close to H max or, or different than H max, substantially? Substantially different, right? Because this source is very predictable. With the 50%, even though it has a large number of symbols, 50% of the time I can guess that it's symbol one and be right. You know, between first two symbols, I have 50% and 30%. 80% of the symbols are one and two, and the rest of them are very rare. So this is a very predictable source. If you try to uh, encode this using using natural encoder, you have eight symbols, therefore three bits per symbol to encode eight different values. Uh, 
let's calculate uh, the entropy of this source. So the, here I'm going to put the self-information of the source. Here I'm going to put the uh, probability i times probability. And then here at the very, very bottom, we're going to have uh, the entropy. So the self-information here becomes LD of 1 over 1 half, which is LD of 2, which is equal to 1. LD of 1 over 3, 1 over 1 over 3, which is LD of 3, is going to be 1.5850. 1 over 36, so this is LD of 36, becomes 5.16. Nine, nine, and this is all 5.1699, 5 5.1699, 5.1699, 5.1699, 5 and 5.1699. Notice that self-information of these symbols that are relatively rare is relatively large. And this is intuitively kind of uh, pleasing because you understand that if something is a rare event, and when it happens, there's a lot of information that is being delivered by this occurrence. Now, uh, your probability here are, are given such, so I'm going to rewrite this. So I times uh, PR, so this product of these two, this becomes 0 0.5, 0 0.5283, 0 0.1436. 0 0.1436 all the way to the end, 0 0.1436. So your entropy is going to be some of these, and it's going to be 1.89. So if I try to uh, encode this using a natural encoder, tells me that I need 3 bits per symbol. But based on the uh, Shannon's uh, source coding formula, if I calculate the entropy of this source, it tells me you can do much better than that. You can actually encode this source with less than two bits per sim, which, which tells me that you know, if I do my encoding right, you can save the 30% of my data requirement right there by encoding you know, on the transmission side, which uh, uh, allows me to use my channel at least 30% more efficient. So, um, how do we do that? Let's uh, go into coding. Now, what uh, we've been doing so far is taking every one of these uh, symbols and assigning it a code word. Now, uh, in uh, everything we've done so far, implicitly we've assumed that every one of these code words is encoded with the same number of bits. Right? And that's where it led us to these three bits per symbol. And that's what we did in PCM too. We had, you, you sample, you quantize, and then you have eight bits per sample, regardless of how probable a given sample is. <laughs> but now, you know, to achieve this, we do the following reason. We say, okay, there are symbols that are occurring very often and symbols that are occurring relatively rare. It seems to me that if I want to design an efficient coder, I have to give up on this idea that every symbol deserves the same number of bits. If the symbol is occurring very often, I'm going to encode this symbol with small number of bits. And then if the symbol is occurring relatively rare, I'm going to give him a large number of bits, knowing that because of its rare occurrence, I'm going to be transmitting this large number of bits relatively rare. So in order to achieve this efficient coding, we actually, first thing we give up on is the same number of bits per symbol. And we come to the notion of the variable uh, variable length encoder. Now, where, where the, the number of bits that it takes to encode a particular world is going to be inversely proportional to its probability. If probability is high, we're going to try to give small number of bits to that symbol. 
if the probability of that symbol is low, we're going to give a larger number of bits to that symbol. Now, once you start approaching, uh, once you start going that route, then you enter into something that is coding design. And there are several considerations there that needs to be taken into account. Uh, in the book, he goes several pages discussing different different uh, properties of the coders, whether they're instantaneous or non-instantaneous, and so on. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on it. Let me just uh, go through a couple of examples to illustrate the main ideas uh, and uh, kind of encourage you to read the sections in the book. It's relatively straightforward, but it takes a lot of time. Uh, I hope these markers show up on a <coughs> so, so there are several challenges. Putting here the challenges for variable length. Length. First one is synchronization. What is a, a synchronization property? Well, if you think about it now from the standpoint of the receiver, what is coming to the receiver is, uh, is a string of zeros and ones, right? Now, synchronization property assumes that uh, the receiver would have only one way distinct way to break this incoming sequence into individual symbols, right? That's a synchronized code. The synchronization can be self-synchronization, where it is obvious in the code where the boundaries of each symbols are, or it can be something that is, that is known between transmitter and receiver. Natural encoder has does not have self-synchronization. You have to say, okay, from here to here uh, is first symbol, and then the receiver can count every three symbols and so on. But just looking at the stream, it is not able to uh, separate them, right? There are codes that are like that, where you have to actually know where the boundaries of the symbol are, but there are codes that are self-synchronizing. So that's, if you're dealing with a variable length encoder, then one of the fundamental properties you should have it needs to be self-synchronizing so that when you look at the, the strings of zeros and ones, you can say, oh, okay, this is the first symbol, second symbol, third symbol, and so on, so that you can synchronize the receiver to the incoming, uh, incoming symbols. So if the synchronization, that means only one way, only one way of breaking up Incoming big string into symbols. Okay, so if that's that's possible, we uh, call the uh, code self-synchronized. The second one is is a property that uh, the code should possess is instantaneous. instantaneous, right? The, the code is called instantaneous where you don't need to wait for the next symbol before you decode the previous one, right? So the code is instantaneous if, uh, let me decoder, decoder uh, can decode each symbol after its arrival. Without waiting for the next one. Okay. 
Okay? And what I'll do is let me risk one more property and then I'll give you an example where we can check some of these properties on, on a different codes. The, the third condition that is also challenging for variable length encoders is something called prefix condition. And if the uh, code satisfies the prefix condition, uh, so that means that no symbol in a code is a prefix of any other symbol. So let me give you an example here to illustrate this. Uh, this is an example, uh, I would say portion of example 631 in the book, where the author kind of goes to several different, more elaborate uh, examples of all of these three properties. So let's uh, look at the uh, symbol here. And uh, this particular uh, source has five symbols, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. And uh, I guess these are probabilities. So it's one half, one quarter, one eight, one sixteen, one sixteen. And there are four codes, code one, code two, code three, and code four. And uh, let's say, for example, in the first code, I encode the first word with one, the second with zero, one, the third with zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, right? So that's, a, that's a one way of encoding, right? Whenever the first symbol comes, I send one. Whenever the second symbol comes, I, I send uh, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, and so on, right? So that's one way of encoding. Let's look at the Code number two, I send one, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 zero. So that's yet another way, right? It's uh, pretty much the same length, uh, but the uh, reverse of one another. So the next code, this is zero. This is one zero, one one zero, one 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 zero, one 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 one. And the third one is zero zero, zero one, one zero, one one, one one zero. Right. So there are all different candidates. Now let's check out some of these properties. Which ones are self-synchronized? If you look at code uh, one is it self-synchronizing? If you look at, uh, let's say, let's just look at uh, A2, A3, A1, for example. A2 would be 0, 1. A3 would be 0, 0, 1. A1 is going to be 1. Let's say A5, 0, 0, 0, 1. If you know that you've encoded with uh, code C1, is there only one way to break this sequence, right? How would you break it? You know that wherever there is a 1, that's the end of the symbol, right? So here's the end of the symbol, here's the end of the symbol, end of the symbol, end of the symbol, right? So the decoder can synchronize to the incoming sequence. This is a synchronized code, right? The same thing with this one. You know wherever the one is, that's the beginning of a new symbol. But uh, uh, while this one here is, uh, while this one here is uh, instantaneous, meaning that as soon as I have one, I declare the end of the symbol. This one is not, because if, if I have one, zero, zero, I, I cannot say that this is A3. I have to wait for the next symbol before I can decide whether this is A3 or it's A4 or possibly A5. So this one is synchro synchronized, self-synchronizing code, but it's not instantaneous. Well, this one is instantaneous. Go ahead. How many types in synchronization? Hmm? How many types in synchronization if you have like different, ty different types of symbol? There are no types of synchronization. Either the code is either uh, self-synchronizing or not, right? 
and it's a matter of can I break this sequence <coughs> in a unique way without uh, without uh, uh, knowing where the beginning. So you, you cannot break the like the the code. I mean, like just four by four or something like that. No, if I did that, I would end up with nonsense, right? <laughs> If I, let's say I try to do that, and I break four by four, right? So this, one, two, three, four, right? So I end up with zero, one, zero, zero. Is there zero, one, zero, zero here? No. No, no. so the, 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 I end up with a bit uh, a word that does not describe any of one of my symbols, right? So uh, that's, that's what, what the synchronization is about. There is, once I receive this sequence and I know my code table, there is only one unique way how I can interpret this, right? So the code is synchronized. So the boundary is one, right? So when the boundary, comes in, in one, this case, the boundary is every time I see the one, that's the end of the end of the end of the word. And in this case, it's it's synchronous because I can divide it into uh, into symbols unambiguously. And it's also instantaneous because as soon as I get one, I'm done with that symbol. Mm -hmm. This one is also synchronous uh, code, right? Because I can break it into into individual symbols, but it's not uh, instantaneous because I have to wait the beginning of the next symbol before I declare the previous symbol, right? And so, uh, <coughs> if, if you look at uh, uh, also code two, this one does not support the prefix condition because uh, zero, zero, A2 one. is a prefix right. of, of A3, it's prefix of A4 and so on. Right? And, and there's much more examples <coughs> and I'm going to leave it there. Uh, leave it there uh, just uh, uh, for you to read, but I wanted to kind of illustrate some of the things that we need to worry about once you go away from a fixed length coder, right? Now you have, you know, uh, problems of how you break up the word and is it a unique way or do you need to wait for the next symbol and so on. So if I look at this particular source, um, here are the things um, that, um, and let's take a look at this code number three for, for an example. There's something, something special about this code. Uh, let's take a look at the average length of the code 3, and this is going to be some probability of i, where i goes from 1 to m, times the length of i. So this is the average length of a code. It's going to be probability of a given word times the length of a given word, right? So this gives you average, average length of the word. So in this case, I have probability of the first one is 1 half times 1 plus the probability of the second one is 1 quarter times 2, plus probability of the third one, which is 1 eighth times 3, and then plus probability of the fourth one, which is 1 16, and probability of the fifth one, which is also 1 16 times 4. When you calculate this average word length, it is 1.9 Three seven five. So this is average code word length for the code three. If I calculate the entropy of this source, and we did uh, uh, that uh, a couple of, I think, the last lecture, you end up with one point eight seven five. So if I were to choose, uh, if I were to choose uh, code number three to perform encoding of this sequence. I'm actually doing pretty well, right? I'm, I'm uh, not as close as the entropy, but I'm much better than if I use three bits per per symbol, three bit per letter, right? It, this is five, so we concluded if we were to use the same number of bits per symbol, I would have to use three, and we saw that this is quite a bit redundant. In this case, it's it's very very close, right? So. How do I actually get to this code? This code is a special code, code for us. It's a Hoffman code, and it satisfies all of these condi uh, all of these conditions. That if there's a prefix condition, and all of that is satisfied for this code. So, uh, this code number three is a Hoffman code. So let me talk about Hoffman. It's actually H U Hoffman. 
encoding up. This algorithm is actually the one that will help us get to the age of X. It will help us, it will teach us how we devise the codes that allow us to approach to the entropy of the source as close as we want. So the way how uh, Huffman encoders will generate a code that satisfies the prefix condition, no other word is going to be prefix of any other, it gives the smallest possible average code word, which is important for us. It will, it is kind of guaranteed to give us the best uh, uh, encoding uh, solution. It is uniquely decodable. It is instantaneous, but it's not self-synchronizing. So we'll we'll look into that in, in just a second. So let's uh, let's uh, in in a book you have algorithm that. Uh, teaches you how to do Huffman encoding, I find it a little bit hard, right? It's, it's not, uh, I don't know why he included that one. There is a much better, easier algorithm for Huffman encoding that I'm going to present to you here, right? So we're going to see how it works. Uh, you're, you can use either one of them. I'm familiar with both. You know, there's very little at my age that can surprise me, you know, but uh, my my, I, this is how I learned it, and I and I also feel objectively it's easier to do it this way. So what I'm going to do is actually illustrate how you do Huffman encoding through a couple of simple examples, and you can see there's this distinct algorithm that uh, allows you to do encoding. So what I'll do is um, I'm going to start with uh, with uh, I guess uh, let me give you an example here and walk you through steps, and then we'll check. Uh, the redundancy and, and entropy and how good this particular code is doing. And I think I have two examples that, uh, of, of the code. So let's uh, first look at this example. I'm going to have a, a source that has five uh, words. 2, x3, x4, x5. Let me put their probabilities. First one has probability 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.20, 0 0.15, 0 0.15, right? So I have uh, five sources that their probabilities. And uh, here's how you approach this. You have uh, three do these stages and here's how you work this coder. You always start from the bottom, you take these two probabilities and you add them together. 0 0.15 and 0 0.15 is 0 0.30, right? And then you kind of look at where would that fit in the, if you were to sort this in descending order. So if I have 0 0.3, it is higher than any one of these, right? So you write it over here, 0 0.3. And what I do is I kind of draw this line saying, OK, these two symbols became 0 0.3, and they shot to the top of the, of the chart. And then this 0 0.25 goes here. And this 0 0.25 goes here. And this 0 0.2 goes here. So now, what you ended up with is the column that has one less entry, right? And then you repeat that process. So now 0 0.2 and 0 0.25, it's going to be 0 0.45. So this goes now to the top of the chart. 0 0.3 falls one step down, 0 0.25. Then 0 0.25 and 0 0.3, that's 0 0.55. So that's now at the top of the chart, and 0 0.45, and then these two uh, give you 1. So that's the first, first part of the algorithm, right? So that's the step number 1. I can use that red one. <laughs> so, so that's in the first step. Go ahead. 
this case is just only you can have like the same number like x4 and x5 if you don't have like same certain number of I mean like the result of the p1 so how do you supposed to solve it I'm not solving anything what, what, what am I solving I'm just executing right right I take the two at the bottom and then I rank them in the table here uh -huh. and in every time here uh, pretty much they ended up going to the top of the chart. They don't have to do that. I'll do the next example where that's not going to be the case. But you, you see, this is relatively easy to execute. There's no, just uh, no wisdom to it. Just uh, follow the algorithm. So if the two bottom uh, probability equal what you have on top, say, what happens? Then you just put it wherever you want, right? The, it's not the unique way, right? What, what Stanley is saying that what if uh, these two, 0 0.15 and 15, end up being 0 0.3? And this one is also 0 0.3. So how do I rank? Put them, you know, one next to the other. It doesn't matter. You can put it on top or on the bottom. It's it's gonna be the same same result. Now this is in the first step. So you execute this until you get to one, and then you work your work your way backwards. Wherever you see this uh, this uh, division, then you put zero on the top, one on the bottom, right? So there's zero, one. 0, 1, 0, 1. So that's the second step. And then to devise the code word here, you would actually trace how you get to here from here backwards. So if you look at the code for x1, how do I get from x1 to, to this point here? I, I'm going to follow this path. Here I'm going to 1. Here I'm going to 0. So I'm, I'm going to put it up. 1, 0. So this is the code word associated with x1. Look at the path. There's a path. Right? So to get to this x1, I have to, I'm following here, no, no branching. Here I'm branching, but I'm coming to 1, right? So I put 1 here. And then here I'm branching, but I'm coming to 0. So I put 0 to the left. Let's do for x2. I go here, I'm going through a zero branch. Then I travel here, and I'm going through a one branch. So this is zero, one. Right? So that's the code for the second one. For x3, I'm going through one branch here, and I'm going through one branch here as well. So this is one, one. For x4, I'm going zero branch, zero, zero. So it's going to be zero, zero, zero. And for x5, I go one, no, one, zero, zero, right? So it's going to be one, zero, zero. So here are the five codes for, for this particular, for, for, for this particular source based on, uh, uh, now, uh, what I have devised here, let's calculate and see how this encoder is doing. If I calculate the average code word length for this example here, it's going to be 0 0.25 plus 0 0.25 plus 0 0.2. These are the first three symbols that I have. 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and 0 0.2. Each one of them has what? how many bits? Two, right? So times two, and then I have uh, 0 0.15 plus 0 0.15 times three, right? So this gives me 2.3 as the average code word length in this case, right? What is the entropy of the source? Entropy of the source is going to be sum when i goes from one to m, pi. LD of 1 over PI, which when you calculate for this source, I, at this point I trust that you can do that, mm -hmm. you end up with 2.28. 2 so x should be 1, 0, PI, X5, 1, yeah, 0, 0, 0, 1. 1, 0, 0, not 0, 0, 0, 1. No, no, you, you go, uh, you oh, go you backwards, go you go oh. backwards. Right? So, so you kind of travel forward and write them backwards. Right? 
Okay. Go ahead. You want to go ahead? So, uh, so the, the algorithm is kind of like you sum the first uh, the code. Let's, then, let's, okay, let's, uh, I'm going to go through one more example, but let's just get the reading right. Mm -hmm. you, you go from X5 and you want to reach to this one here. Right. So let's see where you travel. You go here, you go through, let's, let's call this intersection or right. branching, right? But you're entering through one. one. Mm -hmm. So you put that one here. Okay. Then you follow, nothing happens here, nothing happens here. Here zero. you go through branching, Good but you're good. entering through zero. So here's the zero here. And then you keep on going. You get here, you, it's another branch, you're entering through zero. So there's one, zero, zero. Usually I made a, usually I make a mistake whenever you have like uh, the branch and then the summation of the left to the couple two branches mm -hmm. over there and then whenever you have the the summation of the branch then do you need to have like zero and one something like that yeah whenever you okay. have the summation you put zero up and one down you can you can do the opposite everything you can do opposite here. you can put one up and zero down you will end up with a slightly different code but it will have the same property. So I'm teaching you one way that I always stick to, right? And, and you know, you can have other ways, but you can also make mistakes. There's nothing to be gained by doing it uh, in a dual way. But this way, you can always get it, and, and chances of making a mistake is minimal. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, um, if you follow the method using the textbook, mm -hmm. I try to use it for this, or the other guy is about it. You may not get you may not get the exact the same code, yeah. but you're gonna you should get the same exact uh, average, not getting the same average code word length. Yeah, you're not getting. Yeah, it's one example to the textbook. Okay, well let's look at that after after the, the class. See, you should get the same average code word length, and uh, I got two point six. Two point six? No, it, 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 that, that you did something wrong because Huffman encoder is better than that, right? You know, you did something wrong. So if, if I'm getting 2.3 with this encoder, I think it's right. Yes, that, true. It's that means right. your encoder is not Huffman encoder because they all should give you the same code, code word length. Right. What's, okay. what's the top uh, summation times 2 there? What is that? These, these are the first symbols, the probability. This is this, is this right? right? The probability of a symbol times its length. You have the first symbol with two, 0 0.25 times the length of the code 2. Second symbol, probability 0 0.25 times the code word length 2. Third symbol with probability of 0 0.2 times the code word length 2. Mm -hmm. So these are the first three symbols, each one having two bits per symbol. And then the bottom two symbols having three bits per symbol. So the average code word length is 2.3. What is the top one equals 1.4? The L, the 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Well, it's kind of a multiplication. Yeah, so be plus. Multiplication. Yeah. Plus, right? Plus, okay. plus, plus, yeah. Yeah, that's missing, right? So you're, you're executing this summation. Okay. Uh, excuse me, should be plus or multiplication because based on that? No, no multiplication. You plus, plus, right? Oh, the summation, oh, yes. Yeah. All right, so let, let me actually do one more example. It's going to be a little bit. Go ahead. Uh, so is this self synchronizing this code? Well, uh, I, I don't think it is. I, I forgot. Let's, let's just see. 0, 1, 1, 0. Let's just uh, put them one next to the other. 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. One. Can you break this in a in a uh, unique way? No. No. So it's not self-synchronizing. So you have to. But it's uniquely decoded, right? If you if you try it, uh, uh, if you decode the whole sequence, there there is there is going to be only one way how you can decode. There's. Uh, Let's, let's go through another example. Okay, so just before I go there, let me finish this one. So this is the average entropy. 
So if I were to calculate the redundancy of this code, the redundancy is going to be h max, or or essentially h of uh, h max minus h x over h max. Okay, h. Yeah, H, uh, no, redundancy here is defined slightly different because this is the redundancy of the code. So I'm going to uh, say here the redundancy is going to be the average <coughs> n minus the entropy divided by uh, the average work line. So this is how the redundant Kaufman code is. If, if you find out that your average word length is the same as the entropy, then the code is not redundant at all. Right? You're actually having the code that has met the bound. In this case, your encoding is 2.3 minus 2.28 divided by 2.3, which is just 0.6%. Uh, and if you were to look at the redundancy of the natural code, if I have uh, five symbols and three bits per symbol, this would be three minus 2.28 divided by, by three, which is gonna be 24%. So you can actually save almost quarter of your throughput by just encoding the, the symbols using half of the code. This is how, how much you can compress. Let's, uh, let's look at an, another example, and this is going to be a little bit longer example, but nevertheless, let's do, do it so that we practice this algorithm. in the code word. It does. It makes a difference. The, the code, the Hoffman code is not unique. Oh, but that would be the same. It, but the, the performance is going to be the same. Right? You may end up with the different code words, but, uh, but uh, the, the length of the length, the right, the efficiency of the recording may be the same. It's going to be the same. So let's take a look at uh, this one. It has, uh, so here's a symbol. I'm going to have eight symbols, so x1 x2, x3, x4, x5, x6, x7, x8. Let's leave, we're going to leave one column for code word. Here is where I'm going to put probabilities of this symbol, so this is going to be 0, 28. I'm in 0, So now we're going to go through individual steps. These are called reductions. So this is reduction one and so on. So how do we do this? 0 0.05 and 0 0.05 is 0 0.1. Uh, sorry, this is actually 0 0.4. So is it larger than 0 0.28? No. no. So this guy just travels over. This one travels over. This one travels over. This one travels over. 0 0.10 travels over. Now, 
0 0.05 and 0 0.04 is 0 0.9. So this is 0 0.9 and this is 0 0.07. So this is where the action occurs. Now, these two taken together, that's 0 0.16. So this goes straight to the third place. So this is 0 0.28. 0 0.18, 9 and 7, 16, so this is 0 0.16, and this is coming from way below. Now there is 0 0.15 here, 0 0.13, and 0 0.10. So that's a reduction number 2. Reduction number 3. Now we have 13 and 10, that's 23, that goes to a second place. So this guy goes 0 0.28, 0 0.23, coming from way below. And then these guys all slid down. So this is 0 0.18, 0 0.16, 0 0.15. 0 0.15. 0 0.16 and 15 is uh, 0 0.31. So these two guys will go on top. 0 0.31, 0 0.28, 0 0.23, 0 0.15. So this is reduction 4. 18 and 23. That's 41, so this is 0 0.41, 0 0.31, 0 0.28. This is reduction 5. So sum of these two is 59, right? So 0 0.59, 0 0.41, and then these two give you Okay, so that's uh, that's the first step. The second step is you go wherever you see the branch, you put zero on the top, one at the below. So zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, and then you start uh, devising the code word. If you travel first one, you see it has only one branch here, one and then it goes to zero. So you write here one, zero. So that's the uh, word associated with the first one. Let's look at the second one. You're traveling this way. You go one, one, right? So you write it backwards, one, one. Code word for the second one. Code word for the third one. You're traveling this way. You go to one, so there is one here. Then you enter here, you go zero, one, one, zero. zero, and then zero, right? Again, right. if I'm doing everything right. So it's one, zero, one, zero, and then zero, zero, one, one, oh, one, one, zero, 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 one, two, three, four, five, and then one, two, so those are the code words in this case. And you can see that uh, you know, as, the, as the probabilities in, uh, decrease, your uh, length of the code word becomes larger. This one is uh, 0 0.28 probability. That's why we encode this with uh, just two bits. This one has a very low probability. That's why we assign five bits to this one. Now, if we calculate uh, uh, Mm -hmm. the average. Yeah, let's calculate uh, the average code word length and, and redundancy in this case. Average code word length is going to be 2 times 0 0.28 plus 0 0.18. Why? Because you have these two code, Into bits. code words, just two bits. And then plus 3 times, which ones have 3? These 0, 15, 0, 3. 15, 0, 3. So it's 0 0.15 plus 0 0.13 plus 0 
And then you don't have, you have one with four, so this is plus four times 0 0.07, and then five times uh, 0 0.05 plus 0 0.04. When you calculate the, the answer here, the answer is 2.79. The entropy of the source, age of x in this case, is 2.75, so you end up with a code redundancy, which is 2.79 minus 2.75 divided by 2.79, which is 1.43%. So this way we've devised a code that is very close to the entropy, very, very close. If, if the redundancy is smaller than 1%. What is the average code word length? The average code word length is 2.79 bits per second. So that's, a, that's a, a, what, what this code is capable of achieving. Now, what uh, we still haven't uh, shown is this. I mean, yes, this is great. It is approaching very close to the entropy of the source. But can it be better? Right? Because remember, the, the source coding theorem told us we can get as close as we care to get. And I need to show you, I'll do that next time, how you can actually approach the entropy as close as you want to approach it, right, to the, to the input. Go ahead. Is it this, uh, this code word, is it like synchronized? Uh, we already discussed, it's not, it's not self-synchronized, but if you have a sequence, you're actually uh, you actually can can break it. So, so whenever it comes with a code word, actually I'm still confused with it. how do we determine if it's synchronized or not? I mean, like whenever. Let me let me. What I'll do is since we're kind of at the very end, so let me do an example next time that I show you how you actually break the words. What we need to do next time is show how you can actually approach to the center even closer than what uh, this example does. And what we'll see that you can do that by encoding multiple symbols at a time. All right, let me give you some uh, homework, some homework <laughs> problems. Some so, energy on the exam. Right. Homework is 611, 622, and 623. As far as the exam, we said the exam is 28. That's yeah. yeah. I'm just asking if you know you're on the exam. Of course. What else? Yeah, of course. That's what I'm I think this is his favorite, like... This this appears on every exercise, right? This, this your favorite. Or this kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It's fun, but it's, there's room for error. Well, that's why I do a lot of examples, you know. <laughs> just do a few examples. It's actually very, very, very... Yeah, it's easy. Yeah, you have a so how do we get the, the, the bit rate relative to the symbol rate? Is that all wrapped up into this? No, no, what, we still haven't got there. Bit rate versus symbol rate. Oh, well, yeah, you can, you can, you can talk about it this way. Symbol rate is the rate at which source gets it. puts its symbols on the channel, right? And let's say, let's say this is the, the it has a sampling rate of, let's say, one kilobit per, per second. So every time it samples, it will produce a symbol. Right? It will sample quantized, and there will be symbol produced. So that source would have one kilo symbol per second. And then if you encode it this way, this one kilo symbol per second would actually translate in 2.79 kilobits per second. Because on average, it takes 2.79 bits to encode the symbol, right? So even though the bit rate is longer for x8, we're... Yeah, the, even though you need the, the, the more bits to represent x8, right? because x8 occurs relatively infrequently, your average rate is, is much, much lower. Right? It's much, much lower. But if you get two x8s coming along, I mean, you're going to have to buffer all this, or you're going to lose your... You have your to buffer. Yeah, you have to buffer. You always have to buffer, because you cannot... If you have your variable length encoder, if you if the rate on the line is, is constant, then there is no other way to have to buffer. You have to buffer. 
but uh, you know, we, the, the buffers are, are uh, then you can go into calculation how large those buffers need to be. But that's that's routinely done, right? Routinely done, and because and, uh, this is a very very cheap way of getting uh, the reduction of your bit rate, right? Because if you have a lot of sources come with unequal distribution of the, between each individual symbol, and by doing this, you're actually uh, making sure that all the bits that you're sending are actually carrying information. So you're, you're doing quite a bit of compression. Now, this can be done real time, but more often it's actually done offline. Like if you, if you do a compression of a file or do compression of a document or whatever, then you actually do these kind of things. You end up going through a document, you segment it into symbols, which is a certain number of, of, of bits, and then you look at these individual symbols and then you cross-code them, right? So you look at what is the probability of this symbol occurring, and then you devise a code book and device you know, in compressed space on that code book. And you know very well that some some files will compress very nice, some files will compress poor. Files that compress very nice are the files that you have a lot of redundancy. And you think about absolutely white image. And then that image, you can take the whole image and you say, I'm going to code this whole image with a single bit. Generate white image. Right? So that one compresses very well. Because you essentially have one symbol with probability of 100%. And then on the flip side, you can have a random noise in which where every pixel is different, then over there you cannot get any sort of compression. And uh, that's the difference between compressing, let's say, uh, you know, as I said, uninteresting images versus executed. So. Okay. So, can we generate a key with something like this? You the key, all these codes get separated as soon as they are. Uh, yeah, you generate the key, and then and then basically, essentially, key is this code, right? To split them back, if once we transmit, uh, we have all these codes, we send them in a sequence. Yeah. But then, if you need them, uh, you break them at the receiver based on the yeah, code. Does the receiver have a specific key? Well, it depends. It depends now on the compression scheme. You have two approaches where we always use the same same approach to derive this code book. In which case. The receiver knows what it's capable of deriving the code book the same way as the transmitter. But a lot of times we actually send the code book, you know, prior to transmission so that the receiver, because it's a relatively small overhead, but it simplifies the processing of the receiver. So it's in, in, embedded in the in in compression itself. All right, so that's, that's it for tonight.